Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for attending our session on Spring Data Cassandra. My name is John Bloom. And with me today, I have my good friend and colleague, Mark Palou. He'll be joining us in a minute. Uh, together, we work on the Spring Data team. And we are also the leads of the Spring Data uh, Cassandra project now. So we're excited to share with you today some of the recent developments and changes to Spring Data Cassandra project, as well as what's next. Um, probably the biggest change is that Cassandra is no longer a community project. It has actually moved under the core modules. If, everybody's, if everybody here is familiar with Spring Data, you'll know that it's an umbrella project for a lot of different modules. And about seven or eight of those are actually run by Pivotal, managed by Pivotal. And then the rest are actually managed by the community, like Neo4j, for instance. But all of those actually participate in the release train that we have. Currently, it's Hopper. And we just released our first milestone of Ingles. And Spring Data Cassandra 1.5 is actually part of that milestone, actually. So like I said, we have a lot of great changes uh, in Spring Data Cassandra 1.5 that we'd like to share with you today. I'm going to ask my friend Mark to come up and show you some of those features. Thank you, John. Mark, thank you. So, hi, I'm Mark. And I'm going to tell you about our um, most recent changes to Spring Data Cassandra. And the most important change and um, most uh, asked for change is to lift Cassandra to 3.0 because that was uh, currently a major uh, showstopper to the recent development. See, uh, Spring Data Cassandra was for, uh, based on the 2.0 driver, which wasn't compatible with uh, Cassandra 3. something, and you weren't able to use that. We changed that, changed that, and Spring Data Cassandra is based right now on the 3.0 driver, and you are able to connect Cassandra from 2.2 up to 3.7. And you can also take advantage of the whole version uh, range. And what I'm going to do uh, today is I'm going to demo you some of the features uh, we um, added recently to Spring Data Cassandra. The first feature I'm going to demo is the Java 8 support. Um, maybe you, uh, as, uh, when, you, when you're an existing Spring Data user, you know that we have a couple of uh, these features uh, which we support from, from Java 8. And what we added recently is um, support for wrapped, um, uh, for, uh, wrapped uh, return types and uh, wrapped parameter types. So with Spring Data Cassandra, you're able to use the optional um, uh, wrapper to wrap uh, optional result types. So if there is a result, you get an optional with person in it, like here in the method declaration. And if there is no result, you get basically an empty optional. And the same works as well for stream queries, where we um, basically wrap the result set. And as you use and walk over the results, um, every uh, record is uh, processed one, one by one instead of uh, bulk fetching a whole list. And that's supported on repository level. On template level, uh, we are restricted to not use these types because our baseline is currently Java 1.6. So if you would reference optionals and um, stream types there, we would break compatibility. So the only point where you can use those is uh, in using it in repositories. And I'm going to show you um, a test for that. We have here a repository which saves uh, the, um, a record, and um, this record is then queried and returns just then the optional and shows that the uh, optional is, um, is filled with a val value. And if we uh, then um, pass in an ID which does not exist, then the optional is empty. The next thing we uh, added is uh, JSR 310 date types uh, support. And we support J and Java 8 date types. Um, we support um, the 310 backport types and Yoda date times. 
And these are translated to the correct data type in uh, Cassandra, which maps to the date type. So uh, these, uh, this example um, will run uh, with uh, Cassandra 3.7, which uh, also uses that. We also map uh, the zone ID to, to string, and you can use both types uh, in your rep repository query methods. So let's take a look on that. Well, we, um, we save an order with a local date and a, and a zone ID. And once this is, this is saved, we then can uh, query by using this, uh, these parameters. So let's uh, try it out. Great. And uh, I, now, now you can use that on, on repository level and within your entity model. So you can declare fields uh, uh, with uh, using local date. Please keep in mind that's the Java local, uh, local date and not the data stacks driver local date. You can use both, um, but uh, uh, I just mentioned it to, to uh, make uh, here a distinction. And you can also use uh, the zone ID to um, map um, to, to a particular zone ID. So these are the Java 8 features. And what's next? Next are custom conversions. Well, maybe you have heard uh, of this concept that we run um, a conversion service uh, inside of Spring Data, where, which allows you to register and hook in for custom conversions. So if you, if you don't, don't like our object mapping, you can uh, register a converter which maps from a row to, to one of your custom objects. And you can do also the same uh, on field level. So if you have a custom data type, you can map between a Cassandra primitive and your, um, your target uh, uh, type. And we brought this also to Cassandra. So um, let's take a look how our object model looks like. Well, we have here an address book entity. This maps nicely to the address book uh, table. And inside this entity, we have a contact type. And this contact type is a plain Java object, so don't get um, bothered by the Lombok annotations. Just, that's just to uh, get rid of uh, constructors and getters and setters. Um, besides that, it's a real plain Java object. And up to now, we do not have um, support for user-defined de types uh, in Spring Data Cassandra. So that's something uh, we are going to ship in the future. To, in order to map between um, this address book, uh, um, between uh, these types, we can register custom, conver custom converters, and that's done in the configuration. I derived from the abstract Cassandra configuration, which is uh, one of our base classes, and this carries uh, several informations, um, like uh, the key space name, the entity base package, and besides that, we can um, register a custom conversions object. And this custom conversions object is also used uh, by, um, by the framework int internally to register uh, Java 8 type conversion if you have uh, Java 8, uh, if you're a Java 8 user, and, and so on. And you can hook in with your custom converters into that. So uh, you can then easily um, create a converter, which implements a converter and um, defines the source type, the target type. In this case, I map contact to string, and I do so by using JSON. And by this, I can map my entities or nested entities to JSON. The same for the con converter that uh, marshal, uh, performs the unmarshalling from string to my contact uh, type. And um, by just registering and creating those two converters, I can um, achieve JSON mapping inside of Cassandra. You can uh, take whatever suits, uh, fits your use case. Um, the uh, JSON uh, example is something we get uh, a lot of tickets for, and uh, you have now a chance to do it, this on your own if you're required to do so. Let's take a look on, on this test. Well, this test does not really show uh, too much, but I'm going to stop by in, in, in the assertions so you can really see that uh, we have a uh, really worked in JSON inside of here. Okay, let's take this one. Yeah. And hopefully, well, not, not too good. But you can um, see that we, are, we have uh, some JSON inside of this field. 
and uh, do whatever you need to do with that. And you can, you're really free to define what you would take as, um, uh, as converters, what, uh, in which way you are going to, to use that and, and convert it. You can even hook in, into um, conversion of the uh, Java 8 uh, date time support uh, with uh, adding um, information about uh, time zones, tweak, tweaking uh, the f uh, format, how we do serialization, and it's all up to you how you want to, to use that. What's next? Well, next is a feature we had uh, for a very long time in our documentation as a to-do to, uh, to be delivered sooner or later. And if you know uh, Spring, Spring Data a little bit, the repository abstraction is a, it's a core concept inside of that. Spring Data Cassandra started with uh, the at query annotation for quite a very long time. Uh, which requires you to specify the SQL, the, the CQL statement. You have to, to, to uh, add a select, uh, you have to select the, the columns, uh, you have to specify the table, uh, the work laws, uh, the predicates, and uh, this is quite, quite limited. It works, yes, but it's not, not really nice. What we did right now is we added um, query derivation, so you can uh, declare a query method, find, by us find user by username, and the Cassandra query is derived from, from that point on. So you are no longer obliged to uh, write the query on, on yourself. This works only if you either uh, query um, parts of the primary key or if you create secondary indexes. We do not create secondary indexes out of the box for you, not yet. And uh, so you're um, in the charge of creating uh, those indexes uh, in order to make it work. Otherwise, Cassandra will re just reject those. Let's take a look at how it uh, looks like in, in the test. That's all. In the test, I, I have to, to create uh, this index and then, then uh, basically wait until it's, it's uh, there. Yuck. But uh, currently, uh, there's no, no other way to how to manage uh, that. And what it, what it does is um, it executes uh, a SQL query um, and uh, queries uh, the, the user table by using the username. And we have not only support for the simple matches, but support for all query, um, for all predicate types. We can, you can query in, you can query contains, uh, you can query on greater than. Um, smaller than in, and all that types which are supported by Cassandra, just use them. And what we also did is we have support for uh, SASE indexes, and you just uh, declare your query um, in, in the way how you are used to it, to it from, from the JPA side. Um, find users by, by last name starts with, and this creates a starts with a prefix query requires you also to, to have a prefix index uh, to have uh, set up, and then you are good to go to uh, use uh, SASE index features. Let's try this out. And then um, what, what we basically did here, we start user, and then we um, query on, on, on the um, last name prefix. So, and one last feature. Um, we also have uh, support for uh, projections. So maybe you know, uh, you have heard of projections yesterday in the spring, uh, what's new in spring data talk. And uh, a projection is able to alter or reduce your uh, result. So you are able to either constrain down your uh, domain model to the existing field. So if, if you have a, a user, user object and you do not want to expose the password pro property, you just plug in a pro projection over it and expose just the, the user. And that's what, what you are also able to do with uh, Spring Data Cassandra. And we support projections on uh, collection level. So you have a collection query that uh, queries, in this case, a customer. The customer is a, just a regular uh, entity. And the customer projection is an interface that just exposes the first name. This works on uh, co collections. This works uh, as well as dynamic um, 
projections, so you can pass in the uh, expected type. It works for single entity queries, um, and you are uh, able to do this only on interface level. So we currently do not support uh, DTO projections. That's part of um, JPA and, and MongoDB. For Cassandra, we have uh, some restrictions we have to solve first until you will be able to use DTO projections. So that's it from my part. John? Thank you, Mark. All right, so quite, about a, quite a few things new for 1.5. Um, one thing that we didn't actually share with you after we moved into the community is that we've only picked up the Spring Data Cassandra module since about March, and we've made good progress um, together, as well as we've had some good PRs that users have um, submitted that we've actually got merged in already. Uh, so to recap kind of what we uh, covered, Again, Spring Data Cassandra is now a core module that Pivotal owns and that will manage and will continue to be part of the release trains. Um, the big thing is Cassandra 3, be able to move forward on some of the new developments and features that we want to do with Spring Data Cassandra specifically. The date time types, whether you're using Java 8 or Joda or the 310 backport, um, good support there for converting between Cassandra date types and time types with the Java types. Optional and stream, saw that in the repository abstraction to be able to return optional values or streamed values. Com custom conversions, that's a relatively new thing that uh, was added to basically allow you to register your own converters and tap into the conversion framework that most of you should be already familiar with. The query derivation, that is very exciting. Um, being able to actually use convention over configuration through an at query annotation gives you a lot of flexibility and power. I think that's very important, along with projections. Uh, also a very key thing, if you want to reduce the size of the information coming back, you can condense it down into exactly what you need. And then, as part of this release, it's still kind of a work in progress, is to revise the Spring Data Cassandra documentation. If you've seen the Spring Data Cassandra documentation, you'll see a lot of sections that say, coming soon. They've been coming soon for quite a while, so it wasn't as soon as we had hoped. Um, but the plan is to go back in and fill those gaps and to get the documentation in line, not only with the Spring Data Cassandra module where it stands today, but to line it with the documentation in the other modules, so there's at least some consistency as you go through that and some familiarity. So you can try it right now. As I said, this went out in the Ingalls Milestone 1 release. So it is in the Spring Libs Milestone repo for you to access. This is the coordinates. So what's next? Well, the major theme of Spring Framework 5 is all the reactive extensions, specifically in WebNVC. So if you have an end-to-end -end solution, um, or if you have a solution that needs to be reactive, it doesn't make sense unless the whole entire thing is end-to-end -end reactive. So the major theme in Spring Data 2 will be reactive support, and that will actually include several of our modules like Mongo and Redis, or Redis and Spring Data Cassandra, of course. The other thing that you may have noticed if you've used the Spring Data Cassandra API, specifically the templates, is there's a lot of methods in there, um, and it's hard to discern what's what. So we plan to kind of break some of that apart a little bit, and one of the obvious separations is to separate async as well as synchronous operations, um, as Cassandra supports that in their own APIs, and so by extension, so does the Spring Cassandra template. So it makes sense to kind of break that apart a little bit um, and clean up some of the interfaces in the API. Mark mentioned support for UDTs. Every database has some form of user-defined data types and other types that we want to be able to convert between the Java object model as well as the database model. Uh, that will be an upcoming feature as long as paging. Spring Data Cassandra, or yeah, Spring Data Cassandra does have a notion of a cursor so you can page results. And of course, that is a logical extension to add paging support since that's part of commons right now. Not all modules support it, but Spring Data Cassandra can and it's not there right now. 
The other thing that Spring Data Cassandra does is it has generation for your schema. So uh, for instance, right now you can, uh, there's different schema actions that you can do to recreate your schema, drop it, and that sort of thing. What we want to do and some of the user feedback on Stack Overflow and other uh, forums has been to be able to add and drop columns, for instance, add indexes, that sort of thing, kind of generate those things on the fly based on your model or repository or what have you. Right now you can do that sort of thing, but you have to actually create startup scripts and, and the, the existing support for that is somewhat limited in terms of what it allows you to do. Uh, in the past, some of it was actually broken and so that's been cleaned up and fixed, but there'll be more of that coming. So some other talks that you can attend to find out more on the Spring Data side. Uh, tomorrow, myself and Luke Shannon will be talking about Spring Data and in-memory with Apache Geode and Pivotal Gemfire. And then later in the afternoon, Oliver Girk will be talking about advanced Spring Data REST, which is a continuation of his talk that he presented yesterday on DDD and REST, if you guys saw that. And then the Hazelcast team has new developments in the Spring Data Hazelcast module that covers things like repositories, for instance. Um, should be interesting. All this material that we presented today is online. You can access the slides there, along with the examples. These are actually part of the Spring Data examples. And more information can be found on the wiki, as well as our release schedule is actually in a Google calendar that you can see. And you can also see that on the Spring Data Commons wiki page as well. We actually post all of our different release cycles there. And also on Gitter. So there's a Spring Data channel on Gitter that you can reach out to us on. And as always, feedback is welcome. We welcome PRs. Like I said, we've merged a few already. So if you have contributions, ideas, please share them with us. We're always looking for help, uh, especially since Spring Data Cassandra has been kind of wandering for a little bit, so we want to get it back up to speed, and uh, obviously your contributions are welcomed. Again, you can stay connected by going to, following us on Twitter, going to the Spring Data Projects page, Spring IO blog, et cetera, Stack Overflow. Feel free to reach out to us. And that's it. Any questions? Yes. For, for JSON specifically? Uh, no, but for the defined object, like uh, contact the object, when it has first name, last name. So when it's presented to the database, it's presented as a JSON string or a collection like map? So the question was, when the, in the repository example, when it submitted the contact to be persisted to the database, did it serialize it to JSON and store it in the database? And the answer to that is no. As you know, Spring Data Cassandra is a columnar store. It's going to map each of the fields out to columns within the database, depending on how you set up your schema. If you have some kind of interesting schema structure where you maybe only have a single column, you might need to resort to other means to serialize that. But by default, it's going to map it to the columns in your table, much like JPA would today. So it used, so are you familiar with Spring Data repositories? So there's a mapping abstraction, right? So underneath Spring Data repositories, there's a mapping infrastructure that looks at your domain object and uses the Java Beans model to determine what the properties are and maps that to the structure of the underlying data store. Okay, so it first name, last name as key. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Sure. Okay, so the question is, when you have a projection, does it select everything from the table, or does it select only what's in the um, projection, the object? And I th think it selects everything at present. Um, I mean, you know, that'll be something we can look at down the road to see whether there's ways to optimize that.
questions over here? No? How many people are using the Spring Data Cassandra model, model, module today? Excuse me. A few of you. All right. Well, thank you very much for attending, and have a wonderful day.